Greetings, everybody. Thank you very much to, uh, to Nick and to Eugene and to um, Todd and all of my co-panelists, as well as to um, uh, the wonderful folks at the Federal Society. Okay, uh, welcome. So uh, I'm Nick Rosencrantz, and I'm delighted to be here moderating the uh, Young Scholars panel. I think this is one of the most important things that the Federal Society does, try and help develop the work and the scholarship of young scholars. So I'm particularly happy to be here. Um, I'm just going to uh, introduce our speakers and tell you a bit about the format, and then we will get going. Uh, we have four uh, very impressive young scholars here today, and then two more senior commenters will be commenting on their work. I'm going to give you very abbreviated uh, bios for these impressive folks. You should look online to see all their accomplishments. Uh, our first young scholar is Will Bode. He graduated from the University of Chicago and from Yale Law School. He clerked for Judge McConnell in the Tenth Circuit uh, and for Chief Justice Roberts at the Supreme Court. He's currently a fellow at the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School. Second is Dan Markell. Dan graduated from Harvard College and Harvard Law School, and he also holds an MPhil from Cambridge. He clerked for Judge Hawkins on the Ninth Circuit. He's now the Delambarte Professor of Law at Florida State University College of Law. Third is Andrew Schwartz. Andrew graduated from Brown and then Columbia Law School. He clerked for Judge William Fletcher of the, of the Ninth Circuit and for Judge Naomi Reese Buckwald of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. He is uh, currently an associate professor of law at Colorado Law School. And fourth is Human Shadab. He graduated from UC Berkeley and USC uh, Law School. He's now an associate professor and associate director of the Center for Financial Services Law at New York Law School. And so those are our four young scholars. We have our two more senior uh, commenters. Our first is Eugene Volek. Uh, it's, of course, impossible to do justice to his resume in an introduction, and I suspect you all know, uh, know him well in any case. Just to mention some highlights, he graduated from UCLA College and Law School, clerked for Judge Kaczynski on the Ninth Circuit, Justice O'Connor at the Supreme Court, He's published a vast amount of scholarship. He's also the lead conspirator of the widely read blog, The Volokh Conspiracy. He's the Gary T. Schwartz Professor of Law at UCLA School of Law. And our second commenter is Todd Henderson. Todd's a graduate of Princeton and University of Chicago Law School. He clerked for Judge Dennis Jacobs of the US Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. He's a leading scholar in the fields of corporations, securities regulation, bankruptcy, law and economics, and intellectual property. He's now a professor of law at the University of Chicago Law School. And I should just say we're particularly grateful to Todd for joining us today because he agreed to step in at the last moment after the tragic and untimely death of Larry Ribstein, who uh, would have been here today. He uh, was a great friend and mentor to many of us, including Todd. And so Todd, I wonder if you'd just say a couple of words about that. Uh, yeah, thank you for that uh, introduction. I feel uh, very awkward being here uh, under these circumstances. I'll do my best to fill uh, Larry's very big shoes. Um, I was watching the 60 Minutes piece about insider trading on Capitol Hill and saw that everybody was aligned that this is a really bad thing and we need to stamp it out. And seeing that 60 Minutes and everybody else thought it was wrong, I, I knew it had to be right. So I started thinking about why it would be fine to have congressmen trading on inside information and uh, why the regulations and attempts to solve it would be uh, completely a, a, a sideshow um, and just a political theater. And I thought, well, maybe I should write this into an op-ed. And uh, so the first person I thought to call to talk about this was, was Larry. And I called him up and I said, hey, Larry, do you want to talk about insider trading by uh, politicians? And I don't know what he was doing at the time, but of course the answer was yes. A, a hundred times I've called him with things like this. And the answer was always yes. Uh, Larry didn't know me. We didn't have a prior relationship before uh, a couple of years ago. 
I, I, you know, I have no affiliation with Illinois, and he spent countless hours mentoring me, guiding me, criticizing me, raking me over the coals, telling me when I was completely wrong, uh, and offering me an enormous amount of love and care uh, as one scholar to another. So he will be uh, missed by me personally, and I know uh, many of us. Um, so I would just encourage you to uh, do two things. First, go read Larry's work, which is uh, one way that he will live on. And the other is try to live up to his uh, approach to the Legal Academy, which is um, he was iconoclastic, he was incredibly caring, and had an absolute dogged um, uh, zeal in pursuit of uh, truth about the world. So uh, we will miss you, Larry. Todd, thank you so much for that, and thank you for being here and stepping in at the last minute. Uh, so our uh, format here is um, the scholars to my left are uh, primarily public law scholars. And so what we'll do is each of the young scholars in public law will do a 12-minute presentation, and then uh, Eugene will comment on their work and then we'll have the private law uh, scholars speak and Todd will comment on their work. So without further ado, we'll get started and we're gonna start with uh, Will Boat. Yeah. Here we go. Is this working? <clears throat> Section three of the Defense of Marriage Act, called DOMA, provides that in determining the meaning of any act of Congress or an administrative ruling or regulation, the word marriage means only a legal union between a man and a woman. Uh, I, I'm sorry, can people hear him back? Okay. We good? Sorry, I put the mic down. down. So. Okay. okay, is that better? Um, as husband and wife, and the word spouse refers only to a person of the opposite sex. DOMA has become controversial. The executive branch has argued that DOMA is unconstitutional, and several courts have agreed. And if the trend continues, DOMA may well be invalidated or repealed soon. So my paper argues that it's time to think about what will come in its place. Federal, federal law frequently looks at whether or not a couple is married. That's the kind of thing Section 3 of DOMA regulates. And the executive branch and the courts have been assuming that once DOMA is gone, the federal government will just rely on state law to see who is married. After all, marriage is primarily a creature of state law. But states have different rules about who can get married. And as I'll explain, it will frequently be unclear which state's law to rely on. More than 100,000 same-sex couples report being married, and many of those marriages end up crossing state lines. We need a federal choice of law rule to tell us which state's marriage matters. Without one, DOMA's demise may lead to chaos. So with my remaining time, I'll first explain the problem, and then I'll argue that there's a solution. First, it's very possible, it's even likely, that DOMA will be held unconstitutional, but that states will still be permitted to ban same-sex marriages, at least in the short run, and maybe that short run will be pretty long. DOMA's challengers and the courts that have invalidated DOMA have not been arguing that there's a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. Um, instead, they've argued that even if states can make their own decisions about same-sex marriage, the federal government is required to respect that state's choice. There are sort of several doctrinal ways the argument gets framed under intermediate scrutiny and rational basis scrutiny, but the basic argument is that states may well have a tradition of limiting marriage to opposite-sex couples, but the federal government doesn't actually have one. Instead, what it's been doing is looking to state law to decide whether or not a couple marriage is valid, whether or not a couple can get married. And even today, aside from issues of same-sex marriage, it still largely looks to state law when it asks whether the couple was old enough, did they have the right kind of officiant, are they too closely related, was one of them already married to somebody else and failed to get divorced. So the attacks on DOMA have a federalism angle. And whether or not you agree with those constitutional arguments, they seem to be the ones that are gaining momentum. And if they win out, the question will be, what's next? The same sort of problem arises if DOMA is repealed instead of invalidated. So, what's next? The first problem, as I said, is that states have different rules about whether same-sex couples can get married. The second problem is that states don't even agree among themselves about which state's law controls for a given couple. So take the example of a couple that gets married in a same-sex marriage state, then moves to a state that doesn't allow same-sex marriage. Sometimes, if the state is Maryland or Rhode Island, the couple will still be treated as married, even though same-sex couples can't get married in that state. Other times, the state will say they're not married anymore. So there's a real example. Two men get married in Massachusetts, then they move to Texas, then later on they decide they want to get a divorce. 
Texas won't even allow them access to divorce court to figure out who owns property and sort of make a judgment about their rights to one another. Because Texas says they're not married in Texas and you know, we won't have anything to do with it, even while Massachusetts continues to say they're married. And in many other states, it's not even clear sort of which side the state will take on these kinds of controversies or whether it'll take a consistent side. Now, in a sense, this is not a new problem for the states. People have been getting married and moving around for a very long time, but there's just never been widespread agreement about the solution to that problem. Most of the time, states defer to the place where the marriage was celebrated, but sometimes they don't. So then what's the federal government supposed to do about this? If it's true that the federal government usually looks to state law, well, what does it usually do when the states disagree about these issues? And the answer is that's an even bigger mess. Over the course of the 20th century, when the federal courts confront this problem, they've already adopted at least three different approaches. One is based off of a Supreme Court case called Klaxon, which says that in cases in diversity jurisdiction, you apply the choice of law rule of the state where the district court is physically located. It's nothing to do with anything about where, where the parties were married or sort of anything about the actual facts of the case other than where was the lawsuit brought. Um, if you sue in New York, you apply New York choice of law principles. A second approach that some courts have applied is just to make up their own choice of law rule as a matter of so-called federal common law. Good news is that gets you away from this kind of formalistic rule that's just based on the forum where you sue, but the bad news is now you have to come up with a rule, and it's not as if there's a single rule that all the states apply. And the third approach some courts have used, although this is probably the least common one, is to sort of give up on using state law altogether. So if a federal statute says marriage, federal courts just decide on their own whether the couple should be married or not, without regard to whether they're married in that state or you know, any of the relevant states. So federal courts are all over the place, um, and the Supreme Court has never stepped in. Individual circuits sort of waffle back and forth with different approaches. Uh, and as a doctrinal matter, this isn't just about marriage, I and mean, this happens any time federal law draws upon a state law concept. It's sort of all these different approaches uh, fight out with one another. Sodoma has been suppressing this big choice of law problem in the same-sex marriage context, and if it goes away, we'll suddenly have to answer it again. The last part of my paper offers sort of my own tentative thoughts of what to do. Uh, but in my view, what to do also is related to who does something about it. So Congress could fix this problem by providing a statutory rule. I mean, one of the, well, one of the bills that's been proposed to re repeal DOMA contains a rule. So it would say, uh, you just look to whether or not the marriage was valid in the, in the state where the couple got married. Um, international marriages are sort of more complicated. Uh, a congressional choice of law solution is good. It has more legitimacy than a judicial solution. And it can sort of legitimately consider a broader range of policy considerations. Um, so I think Congress, the rule Congress has proposed makes a lot of sense. I think it sort of allows couples to have a certain amount of stability. They know that when they get married, they'll stay married no matter where they go. Uh, <clears throat> And I think similarly, the executive branch could try to engineer something like that as a matter of coordinated agency action or an executive order. But in practice, I don't think we should hold our breath for either of these things. Uh, conflict scholars always complain that Congress or the executive branch should step in and provide more guidance than a bunch of choice of law issues, and it basically never happens. So it's not necessarily a reason to believe this will be the first time. So then this might fall back to the courts. And out of the three approaches I discussed a second ago, <coughs> I think the one courts have to do is to create one as a matter of common law, even if that's, even if that's a second best option. Uh, this is risky because the whole point of getting rid of DOMA is to get the federal government out of making value-laden decisions about same-sex marriage, but I don't think it can be avoided. The problem with the Claxon rule is that it assumes there's been a lawsuit. That's the one fact it uses to decide what rule to use. And most of the time, federal law is applied and enforced without there being any lawsuits at all. It happens by the executive branch, it happens at administrative agencies, and there may never be a lawsuit and you won't know where it would be. So that's not gonna work as a rule to sort of work across all of federal law. And the approach of ignoring state law altogether and having sort of courts just decide as a matter of, as a matter of independent federal law whether you're married requires courts to make up a law, federal law of domestic relations, which is no easier than making up a choice of law rule, uh, in fact a lot harder and not something they're really equipped to do. So we need a common law rule. Then the last question is what common law rule? Um, and here I think the goal should be for courts to be as sort of as value neutral and to leave as, as small of a footprint as possible. Um, so in the paper I argue that the rule that does that best is to look at the choice of law rule of the couple's home state, their domicile. So if the same-sex couple lives in Massachusetts or Maryland, you look at Massachusetts 
Massachusetts or Maryland law, both of which would say we'll recognize a same-sex marriage. Uh, if they live in Texas, you'd say they're not. Um, you sort of treat them for federal purposes the way they're treated at home. Uh, there are, of course, arguments that a federal law, that federal law should guarantee a constitutional right to same-sex marriage, but that's sort of a choice of law rule is not the right place to do that. That should be done through constitutional interpretation, if at all. Uh, another argument for my domicile rule is that there are a couple of scattered statutory provisions that do deal with marriage. There's one that regulates some of Social Security and one that regulates some veterans' benefits. And if you're a court, you sort of, those are your couple of guideposts you have, and it makes more sense to fill in the same rule around them rather than to try to invent some new rule you think might be better that will then create a statutory conflict. Um, now, <clears throat> you could sort of agree with much of my analysis of the problem and still think my common law rule is not the best one. Uh, I think that's sort of the hardest problem and to some extent it's inevitably one that's subject to debate. But the most important point of my paper is that there's going to have to be a rule and if the political branches don't supply it, then the courts will have to. So the paper is called Beyond DOMA, and the last thing I want to say is that, as I mentioned, this is a problem that may become particularly acute in the same-sex marriage context, but it's really a bigger conflicts problem more broadly. There are tons of areas where federal law draws upon a concept under state law. Property rights and tax and bankruptcy, other domestic relations issues and social security and immigration and elsewhere, even criminal law. And Congress very rarely provides choice of law rules. So the goal of my paper is to provide a framework for those areas as well. Congress can and should provide choice of law rules in as many of those areas or maybe even all of them. But if it doesn't, the federal courts will have to create them. Federal courts can't use something like the Klaxon rule, even though it sort of offers a, a neat and concrete solution. Um, instead, they have to create one as a matter of common law. And they have to create common law in a way that's different from what a legislature would do. So if the demise of DOMA does bring chaos, hopefully the chaos will eventually bring the creation of a new framework for interpreting federal law more broadly. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Our second speaker is Dan Markell, speaking about retributive justice and the demands of democratic citizenship. Uh, greetings, everybody. Thank you very much to, uh, to Nick and to Eugene and to um, Todd and all my co-panelists, as well as to um, uh, the wonderful folks at the Federal Society who have been so exceedingly generous to me for this last year. Uh, it's an honor to be here and share some thoughts with you about this big project that I've been working on uh, this last year. It's, um, it's, a, it's a, unfortunately an, uh, an incredibly and an exceedingly long piece, uh, and unfortunately um, uh, Eugene got tasked with reading about the 130 pages of it. So I'm, it, it's, uh, it's probably going to become the basis of a book, and uh, I look forward to getting your thoughts about it. And let me just sort of give you a few of the bullet points of the argument, and then uh, you know, if you have questions or want to follow up later, you can uh, find me in... Um, or download the paper on SSRM. So uh, the paper is about the tissue connecting democratic citizenship with retributive justice. And the argument is that contrary to some of the leading criminal law theorists like Michael Moore or uh, Doug Cusack, who insist that in order for the criminal law to be retributively just, it has to be predicated on moral wrongdoing, I argue that we need to, or th that we can, as retributivists, loosen up on the criminalization question and move beyond uh, the insistence on moral wrongdoing as a prerequisite for justifying retributive punishment, at least in liberal democracies. And that qualification of at least in liberal democracies is really quite important. In addition to the thesis that there is more flexibility in terms of what plausibly justifies retributive punishment than simply the existence of evidence uh, of, of moral wrongdoing, uh, I also argue that retributivists have to show some respect for democratic lawmaking when it applies to sentencing, but the sentencing issue is distinct from the criminalization question, and uh, if I'm right that there is some kind of way in which democratic authority can generate new moral obligations uh, for citizens, then there are at least some uh, counterintuitive implications that arise, and I'll tell you what they are. So first, it seems to me that as a matter of uh, 
uh, moral obligation, which is to say non-prudential reasoning, uh, we are morally obligated to obey not only laws that seem quite obviously correct, mala and say laws that are obviously liberalism compatible, laws that would ban, say, rape or murder or robbery, but also what I call dumb but not illiberal laws. Uh, and that said, there are actually two kinds of laws that we are not morally obligated to treat as an independent reason for action. Those laws which are spectacularly dumb, as opposed to the permissibly dumb, and those laws which are illiberal. Now, if I'm right that there's more leeway for democracies in sort of carving out a space of what might be called the permissibly dumb laws that uh, might bind us in criminal, vis-a-vis -vis the criminal law, then there's a, a, a slightly peculiar upshot of that when we think about this from a comparative perspective about what regimes uh, are able to do. And that's to say that uh, within liberal democracies, I argue that, uh, uh, that the scope of conduct that's legitimately criminalized and justly punished is larger than what would be justly punished in bad or wicked regimes that are not liberal democracies. So that's the, uh, the sort of the, the core thesis. Now, I don't plan on sort of uh, showing you much of the scaffolding behind those claims, but I'm happy to sort of um, uh, at least cash out a few of those uh, with some examples so that you can get a better sense of where my, where my thoughts are. So one of the things that I had been working on, I guess I've been working in the, in the realm of um, punishment theory for the last dozen years or so, and uh, I've always been one of these punishment theorists who rather than focuses simply on the moral question, it also looks at the political theory issues associated with punishment as a state institution. Now what I hadn't done before is sort of give a whole excursus, I guess, on um, or, or extended disquisition on, on sort of what is the nature of our political obligations. And so the first part of this very lengthy project is to sort of uh, go in and, and sort of see to what extent democratic authority can really um, change our moral obligations uh, to the law. And so I try and I end up weighing in with uh, against the sort of trendy uh, move in the literature to be a philosophical anarchist. And I, I sort of um, throw my lot in with, for the most part, with the, the folks who, uh, like um, uh, Scott Shapiro is one of them, and, and in the philosophy world, people like Cristiano, uh, uh, people who are sort of skeptical of this philosophical anarchist tradition. But uh, although I believe that there is something to be said about the, the nature of democratic authority, I do think that there are obvious limits on its um, ability to create new moral obligations for us as individuals, as citizens. And so the issue is not so much whether there's a, uh, a content independent moral obligation to conform to the law, because I don't really think it makes sense to think about moral obligations as ever being content independent. But the question is, what scope of the content is likely to trigger a moral obligation and what scope is not? And, and so what I try and do is use these ideas of like what counts as permissibly dumb but not a liberal to, uh, versus a liberal versus spectacularly dumb to try and sort of draw some categories about what, uh, what kinds of laws might fit in. And I'll just, so, so in, in parts two of the paper, I sort of say, well, here's what I think from a political retributivist perspective as opposed to a moral retributivist perspective, here's what I think the, the potential for us to, uh, what, what would count as a legitimate criminal law, we could count as the things that would, the negative legal moralists uh, would think are important. The folks like Moore and Husak said like, well, we gotta focus on moral wrongdoing only. I think that's a perfectly legitimate and, and usually quite attractive approach to thinking about the criminal law, but I don't see why a liberally constrained social welfare approach to thinking about harm reduction would necessarily be in tension with a retributive justification for punishment. Now I realize that that seems somewhat peculiar to people, but I hope the paper is able to uh, flesh out that intuition a little more clearly. So let me give you some examples of what I think um, fall under, the, the, under these kind of labels that I've been using. So uh, murder, for example, is a kind of law that I think everyone agrees on would count as uh, you know, a necessary uh, feature of any criminal law to be just. You'd have to have a law like that. There's an interesting question about drug possession, gun possession, possession of burglar's tools, right? So these are all things which are not in the language of the my interlocutors, folks like Moore and Husek, which the possession of which is itself morally wrongful, right? The question is that those are often sort of uh, risky or thought to be somewhat risky 
uh, in terms of their likelihood to uh, endanger other folks. And so my view is that that would fall under the realm of, they, they could be smart laws, they might not be smart laws in terms of whether they uh, are effectively going to diminish these kinds of risks. But my view is that for the most part, prohibitions on the possession of those kinds of things, burglars, tools, guns, or drugs, would fall within the realm of the, the permissibly dumb. Uh, uh, whereas something like a prohibition on chess, right, at all time, for which there would really be no way you could uh, offer the, the grounds of what I would call like a, 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 it's a tweaked version of rational basis with bite scrutiny. Uh, a prohibition on chess, a criminal law that would ban chess, strikes me as lacking any possible rationale. Now, a diff uh, you know, the, the drugs, guns, and burglars tools, so the moral retributivists would say, well, those are all not really morally wrongful. We shouldn't have criminal laws condemning that behavior. You can have regulation. And I try to explain why the regulation approach is, you know, probably preferable, but nonetheless not something that is required at the exclusion of the criminal law from weighing in on some of those things. And then the, there's other examples that I go to, such like eating on the subway, right? That's a, uh, in, here we are in DC, where eating on the subway has at times led to people being criminally liable. And, uh, and I argue that that would actually also fit within the permissibly dumb, but it's not spectacularly dumb. And so those are, those are my intuitions, and I try and flesh out what, they, uh, what, what their the significance is. But uh, the fact that something is permissibly dumb is only the beginning of the inquiry, right? So it, it might be the case that what we uh, need to do with in terms of sentencing is look at whether something passes a rational basis with bite scrutiny, as I call it, in order to warrant a very, very light penalty. But if you wanted to impose a more substantial penalty, I argue that we should actually have, a, you know, uh, the moral equivalent of a tiered approach such that the more punishment you wanted to impose on someone for a particular kind of conduct, the more intense the scrutiny we owe as citizens or as officials to the, uh, to the underlying prohibition. So uh, it seems to me that drug possession itself uh, could be plausibly criminalized uh, under this approach, but it would not be something that could trigger substantial punishment. Thanks. Um, uh, on the other hand, theft or uh, rape or murder, right, those would be the kinds of things that I think could withstand even uh, the moral equivalent of strict scrutiny. Uh, and so uh, more intense punishments like incarceration would be appropriate. Now, I do think that there still needs to be some second approach in addition to this kind of tiered scrutiny approach. There needs to still be some kind of compatibility with what I, what I think of as good retributive values. But, um, but as I try and articulate in the paper, there's, uh, there's got to be a little bit more play in the joints for democracies than I think retributivists have been willing to acknowledge in the past with respect to these kinds of uh, sentencing questions, as well as the criminalization questions. So um, uh, the last point I'll, I'll sort of circle back to, uh, something I alluded to at the beginning, which is um, not only what our obligations are as citizens in terms of whether we have obligations to conform to these laws, but also whether we have obligations to assist law enforcement or whether as officials we have permissions or, or pro tanto obligations to enforce the permissibly dumb laws. So my argument in the paper is that if a law is permissibly dumb uh, but not illiberal, then that creates uh, what philosophers call a pro tanto reason for you to enforce it if you're an official. Now it can be easily uh, canceled or overwhelmed by other considerations, but the fact that there is a, uh, a law on the books within a liberal democracy that satisfies the kind of preconditions of inclusion in the political process, uh, so, um, in those cases I think that there's uh, an arg a good argument available for thinking that um, uh, more discretion to officials is not actually appropriate in all sorts of instances. Uh, and similarly, even with permissibly dumb but not illiberal laws as citizens, I think we have certain moral obligations to render what I call reasonable assistance to law enforcement when we see violations of those permissibly dumb laws. Now again, the, those are pro tanto reasons. They can be kind of overwhelmed under the circumstances. But uh, I do think that the fact of there being a law within a liberal democracy changes what our moral obligations might be 
uh, at least with respect to the permissibly dumb. Now, that, so, so that's kind of the conservative, I guess I've always wondered why the Federalist Society has been supporting my work, but I, I think there is a um, quasi-conservative aspect to this paper as well as a very radical aspect. And the conservative aspect is that it seems that there's a whole range of laws to which we owe some kind of conformity to the law uh, and, uh, and reason to, um, to help out with law enforcement. On the other hand, the, if, if you sort of have good reason for thinking the law is illiberal or spectacularly dumb, it actually uh, forces you to act in some ways in contravention to the law when you would otherwise be required to act illiberally to, towards someone or in, with, spectacularly dumb, with a spectacularly dumb basis, which is to say with a totally unreasonable basis. So I'll stop there because I've already gone on, but I'm happy to answer questions later and hopefully this will evoke some conversation. Thanks. Um, I want to thank uh, Will and Dan th very much for their very interesting papers. Um, I have some comments, uh, mostly uh, addressed to Dan, but let me begin with ones to Will. Uh, I, I liked Will. I liked your paper a lot. I thought it was very interesting and helpful and clear and well-reasoned. Um, my main suggestion is to, would be to talk more about federal law. Uh, I'm sorry, federal law, excuse me, about foreign, uh, foreign marriages. Um, so a couple married in some country, or perhaps more than a couple, several people married in some country, come to the United States for a visit. One is arrested. The question is whether another can testify against them. Uh, or, and I've long thought this is the single most important benefit of marriage. For most of us, we don't take advantage of it. But for those who do, it's much more valuable than most of the others, and that benefit is being able to give citizenship to your spouse. If you look at all of the tax benefits uh, uh, out there, all of the various other things, the testimonial privileges, and that's nothing compared to the ability to marry someone you want and then have them be able to live and work in the country. Uh, yeah, that's something to which the state law questions will not all, always offer an obvious answer. I think that would be interesting to talk about. Another thing that uh, um, I wish there had been a little bit more discussion of is the possible objections to the uh, statutory proposal which is that uh, the statutory proposal would be that Congress essentially um, make marriages valid pretty much, I'm oversimplifying, but pretty much they are valid in the place of celebration. Which means, as Will points out, since most people choose to marry in a place where it's legal, and since it's easy to travel now to a place where it's legal, that means that it will be err in, in favor of recognizing the marriage. There'll be lots of people living in Texas who are federal law married but not state law married. That need not be bad. And it may be better than the alternative, which is that the same couple, as they move from Massachusetts to Texas to, uh, to uh, Iowa, uh, will be married, not married, married. But still, it might be interesting to think what the possible implications are. Where are there areas where federal and state law operate in the same scheme? What about, I don't know, parental kidnapping prevention act? I don't know if it actually focuses on marriage. Maybe it doesn't. But some of those kinds of schemes, how they would interact with, say, state family law systems. I would have liked to to see that. I also thought, and I think uh, given the, the way that the uh, teaching market operates these days, this is, I think, especially important. People are looking for not just articles that solve a particular problem really well, but also shed light on broader things. And I think this article was helpful because it ra uh, in part because it uh, deals with a broader question, which comes up in copyright law, in tax law, and a variety of other areas of law, which is what happens when you need to rely on state law to figure out whether a contract is valid or something like that. Uh, uh, in order to solve a problem for federal law. So co federal copyright law uh, specifies the consequence of assignment of copyright, but it's pursuant to contract, and there's state law of contract. There is a brief discussion of this at the end of the paper. I would have liked to see a little bit more of a discussion, perhaps with just some examples of how you might tentatively suggest how your, your thinking in this paper might point in that direction, point towards a solution of those problems. Um, the one last thing, and I know this is controversial, but I thought I would just mention because I know there are other juniors in the uh, uh, junior faculty member in the um, in in the audience and would be faculty members, uh, and uh, I've always thought that this panel was in part about conveying ideas about that. Different people have different views on this, but I think this is the kind of talk that would benefit a good deal from some powerpoints. If you have a three-part test, it seems to me there should be a PowerPoint with three prongs. Not necessarily the full text of the test, but a little item. If there are three different approaches, 
there should be, there should be a, a, a slide with three different things. Just because it's otherwise easy for people's attention to wander. I think if you're giving them the audio and the visual at the same time, more likely they'll focus. I know people disagree, and I know PowerPoint has often been abused, uh, but I think that that would be my recommendation. Uh, now, turning to Dan, I thought this was a very interesting paper, and I think part of it is, I think is, is, is right, and non-trivially and importantly right, that if you think that there's some moral significance to democracy, then it seems to me de democratic choice can impose obligations on its citizens in complicated ways that, that just simple platitudes about consent, let's say, don't really, don't, don't really answer. I thought this paper was very helpful for that. Let me just point to, to several specific thoughts that I had. One point that the paper says is that uh, the obligations to follow the law, but also not to follow, or not to follow, not to enforce certain, the, the, this, the very dumb laws, apply equally to government officials and to citizens. And I want to probe a little bit on that. If there is this law against playing chess, I would tend to agree that a police officer would be perfectly justified, in fact would be more justified, in turning a blind eye to the law, to the violations of the law. Likewise, I think if a prosecutor chooses not to prosecute, I think that's fine. If a judge, without holding the law unconstitutional, because your point is not about constitutionality, but about obligation, just says, I choose to dismiss this in the interest of justice, I'd be much more skeptical. And if a prison warden just decides on his own to let out everybody who's in prison who's guilty of violation of the law, I would think that's very bad. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm not sure I can fully articulate why I think this. But it seems to me that it would be helpful to talk more about it. I hesitate to say talk more in the context of it was 130 pages long. You know, this may be its natural length of difficulties. It's hard to get people to read 130 pages. Uh, but, uh, but it seems to me that was something that, was, that, that struck me as underdefended. Also, the assertion that if somebody has a duty to obey dumb but not very dumb and not illiberal laws, they also have a duty to help the government enforce that struck me as not clearly proven. Um, one could say, look, I have a duty as a citizen to follow the law. Even if the law is wrong, my disobeying the law is wrong. But if Will then decide, has to decide whether to turn me in, he sees me violating this law, he agrees it's dumb, but not ridiculously or liberally so, why should he assist the government in the wrong of enforcing this dumb law? I, it doesn't seem to me clear that this would be so. One practical argument that you give, which is a powerful one, which is that for, for reasons of, of social, social cohesion, social functioning, it's bad if every person have, feels that they should be free to disobey any law they like. I tend to agree with that. I'm not sure that that applies to every person feeling free not to call the police when they see a violation of a law that they think is a dumb law. Also, it's possible that the refusal to cooperate, not the refusal to say testify in court when you have a legal duty to do so, but refusal to just simply cooperate, it's possible that that uh, might send a useful signal to, to, to the government about which laws really have lost the uh, support of the public. Uh, uh, now, there are a couple of other things that have to do with situations where you think that the law is not, is, is so illiberal as to be not binding and the consequence of that. One is you give it, there's extent, and you say, if the enforcement policy is to arrest only black men who are guilty of an offense, then at that point the police officer bears moral responsibility for what he does, which I take it suggests the police officer shouldn't do that. Well, you know, it's easy to say now. And I think it would be morally understandable to say that 50 years ago. But somebody who is in a position where their police officer required to do that, and today perhaps less so, there's a policy explicitly focused on black men, but there may be a policy that, for example, arrest men but not women, or throw the book more at men than at women. You may think it's wrong, but the police officer says, you know, but there are people I'm trying to help by being a police officer. So unless you think that everybody now has a duty to just refuse to be a police officer, I think it would be a pretty strong claim if somebody feels that there's, they're doing unbalanced more good than harm. You know, I'd say, look, uh, it's a bad policy, but given that I can't just violate the rules because of the institutional structure uh, of the department, my choice is either I just refuse to enforce this offense and not all the victims, and perhaps the victims of black men are disproportionately black victims themselves, so leave them unprotected. I think that, that, that having morality demand that much is, is it's not clear to me that's a moral result. 
Uh, likewise, at the end, you ask, does a prohibition on gay marriage or consensual plural marriage make a regime illiberal for the purposes of making permissibly dumb but not illiberal laws non-obligatory? And it's not that, you, that I think you think those laws shouldn't be enforced. You ask whether, in fact, because of that, the whole, your whole construct no longer applies, and people no longer have a duty to follow the instructions of the regime in general because it is illiberal in particular parts. And your answer is, I'm not sure, but I'm inclined to think the answer is yes. If that's so, then it sounds like you've produced a very interesting framework for people's duty to obey regimes under circumstances that have never existed in human history, except perhaps in the last couple of years in, I don't know, Massachusetts and Iowa, yeah. according to you, but I'm sure we can find lots of illiberal things there as well. Uh, and uh, if not now, when the next movement alerts us to various kinds of injustices. So maybe you're right, but are you sure you're right? Are you sure your, your, uh, your approach is really, is really that uh, that limited in scope. The last thing I want to mention is this talk of strict scrutiny. Lots of people find it useful to import strict scrutiny and intermediate scrutiny from other areas. I would suggest to resist the temptation. And that's, I know time is short, let me just, uh, uh, time is out. Let me just say very briefly for two reasons. One is, there are very different kinds of strict scrutiny. And then, this is not just an issue for courts, but also if you were just say, you know, we should guide ourselves by strict scrutiny. Is that strict scrutiny for content-based speech restrictions? Nearly fatal, in fact. Is it strict scrutiny uh, as, as was practiced under uh, uh, religious exemption regimes in the Sherbert Yoder era? Famously called feeble, in fact. Uh, which is it? But on top of that, it's also, even if you can identify each one, those are badly underdefined. Courts talk about strict scrutiny and intermediate scrutiny as if they have content. Incidentally, there are many different kinds of intermediate scrutiny. But it turns out that they often don't have much content. So it seems to me you'd be better off actually articulating things that are more tailored to your particular proposal and potentially clearer rather than trying to kind of borrow what I think is the ill-gotten uh, the ill-gotten uh, credibility that, that, that those other, uh, the, the, those, uh, those labels seem to have, have acquired. Thank you, Jim. Great, thank you for that. And that's the public law side of our program today. Uh, and now we begin our uh, Thanks very much and welcome to this afternoon's session. I'm Rick Garnett from Notre Dame. I'm the, uh, I'll be serving as your potted plant this afternoon. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to remind everybody, and also really to take a few minutes just to celebrate the fact that this panel is dedicated to the life and the memory and the work and the friendship of Professor Danny Markell. Uh, many of us, I know, cared about Danny a lot and miss him very much. In addition to being an energetic entrepreneur and a caring friend and a, a doting father and a generous colleague and a prolific and productive and provocative scholar, uh, Danny was a regular at Federal Society events. He was a strong supporter of student chapters and also of the Federal Society's uh, junior scholar programs. Some of you might know that Danny received one of the Federal Society's uh, Searle Young Legal Scholar Research Fellowships back in 2011, and he used that to complete, I think, a couple dozen law review articles, uh, one of which was uh, his retributive justice paper. Um, in 2012, he presented at one of these young scholar panels uh, on retributive justice and the demands of democratic citizenship, uh, and also at one of the inaugural junior scholars colloquia. In these contexts, as in all others, including um, the arena where uh, where I probably spent the most time with him in a way over at Prof's blog, uh, Danny was a constructive and generous and sometimes tough uh, critic and colleague. Uh, Danny was a very dear friend of mine and I'm, I'm really grateful to the Federal Society for, for honoring him in this way. So today we're fortunate to have uh, five excellent papers about which two also excellent commentators will, well, comment. Um, Special thanks uh, in particular to Keith Hilton, who's graciously stepped in because of Todd Henderson uh, is unable to join us. He, he had a, a death in the family, so I hope you all uh, send him your prayers and best wishes. Uh, in the interest of time, I, I won't go through the impressive biographies and fun facts and uh, Twitter feeds of our presenters who are here. 
Uh, you can read the names uh, uh, up here on the table, but we're going to hear from Professor uh, Will Bode, Charles Corsmo, Christopher Newman, Christopher Walker, and Kevin Walsh. And again, as I mentioned, we'll have commentary from Keith Hilton and also uh, from Jim Lindgren. Each presenter has been given uh, 12 minutes and no more uh, in honor of the late uh, Chief, William, uh, Chief Justice William Rehnquist, who died 10 years ago, uh, all requests to continue after the red light has come on will be brusquely denied. <laughs> Thanks, Rick, and thanks to the Federalist Society for having me here, and also for mentioning uh, Dan Markell. Actually, the last time I presented in this room at the Young Legal Scholars Conference was when Dan was here, so I feel like he's still standing over my shoulder, hopefully not shaking his head too vigorously. Um, <clears throat> so I'm here today, and my goal is to try to say something new about originalism. Uh, Current debates over originalism, I think, have stalled uh, to a large extent, uh, and that's because people are, are talking past one another, in a sense. The current debates are either conceptual or normative. Uh, the conceptual debates go something like, is original meaning just inherently part of the, you know, what it is to have text, what it is to have a written constitution, such that if you're, if you're reading a document, you're necessarily caring about its original meaning? Um, that's kind of a, an inherent conceptual argument. Uh, other arguments are normative. They ground originalism in something like popular sovereignty or reducing judicial discretion or reaching sort of good consequences, possibly through a supermajoritarian enactment process. But again, they're focused on the, the ultimate normative out, outputs of the law. And then there are responses on both grounds that no, there are other ways of reading, so originalism is not the only sort of conceptually possible form of interpretation, and the various policy arguments for originalism are contested, and as I say, those debates I think are, are sort of at a standstill. And <clears throat> I think there's a way to move past them uh, by focusing on a different question that both those debates ignore, which is what about law? Sort of what is, is it possible that even if there's no inherently true method of interpretation, or even if there are reasonable debates over the best method of interpretation, is it possible we just have one that's established as a matter of our positive law, uh, and that therefore allows us to, to sidestep uh, large portions of those debates? And in my paper, uh, I argue that the answer is yes, actually. There is a sort of method of, of constitutional law that's legally established and legally shared in our legal system, and contrary to what you might think, it's originalism. Um, so that's, that's the claim. <clears throat> um, obviously, I should also defend or explain what I mean by originalism, since it's probably counterintuitive to say that this well-known contested theory is actually the, the widely shared theory, uh, that people are speaking prose all the time, whether they know it or not. Um, so there's another, but by originalism I mean something that's not just, not just sort of strict constructionism as you may have seen it on TV, uh, and not, not even the idea that every case has to turn only on what, the, on what the founders said. But I also don't mean, I also mean something stronger than just to say that originalism is an ingredient or a starting point or a piece of our law. So, so what do I mean? I mean specifically that the original, the text of the original Constitution, plus the amendments, and the original legal rules for interpreting it, that those two things are sort of the, the ultimate constitutional modality. They are, the, they are the source of constitutional law, and they are the thing by which all other sources of constitutional law have to be judged. In particular, therefore, things like precedent uh, or the use of practice to sort of inform constitutional meaning or resolve ambiguities, those are fine if and only if they are consistent with the text of the Constitution and the legal background of the Constitution. Um, and then they are. So <clears throat> the originalism I'm talking about is one that, that allows for sort of vague provisions or provisions that were intended to have some kind of evolving meaning. So if it turns out to be true that the word reasonable in the Fourth Amendment or the words cruel and unusual in the Eighth Amendment had some kind of a, a shifting content, 
it's, it's an originalist thing to do to, to use that shifting content. Uh, and precedent is permissible because precedent has been a part of our system of constitutional adjudication from the very beginning and nothing in the text of the Constitution rules it out. Uh, details about some of those things will, will come up a little bit in a paper that uh, my co-author Steve Sachs and I are presenting tomorrow, but I'll just leave those there for now. Um, <clears throat> now once you look at originalism in that way, once you look at originalism as sort of the ultimate source of law, if you then turn and look at our constitutional practice, and in the paper I focus on Supreme Court cases, since those are often thought to be unoriginalist, I think you actually find a surprising degree of, of agreement on constitutional interpretation and on this kind of originalism. Uh, it's consistent with what the justices say about constitutional interpretation, not just Justices Scalia and Thomas, but Justice Kagan says that we're all originalists in the sense that when a provision is specifically worded, we follow exactly its specific meaning. When it's broadly worded and was intended to have a broader range of possible applications, we follow that. Justice Alito has said the same thing and described himself as a practical originalist. So that, that'll just frame it by saying that that's consistent with how the justices actually talk about the role of original meaning in the text. And it's also consistent with the cases. So <clears throat> look at cases, they aren't, they aren't every case, but look at cases where the court actually talks about two different methods of constitutional interpretation in, con in contestation with one another. Uh, in Noel Canning, the question comes up about can, can practice trump the clear text of the Constitution? And the Solicitor General had argued to the court that it could, uh, but the court says no. The court says it can consider practice or subsequent practice only if the Constitution is ambiguous finds ambiguity and goes on, but that ambiguity is a sort of crucial gate before you can consider another method. Or look at Heller versus the District of Columbia. When faced with an allegation that the decision would have very bad consequences, the court does not deny it or say that that would be a big problem and sort of try to fight it to a draw. It says it doesn't matter, that what matters is the original meaning of the provision, that trumps this other, this other method. On the other hand, if you then go look at cases that are sort of taken as the, the counterexamples, the cases that, that repudiate originalism, Blaisdell, Brown versus Board, a lot of other cases I go into, if you look at what they actually say, it's not so clear any of them openly reject originalism. So the majority opinion in Blaisdell interpreting the contracts clause uh, uses the same sort of originalist framework I've been talking about. It says, if it's true that the provision has a sort of specific meaning that doesn't admit of various kinds of exceptions and evolving circumstances, we'd be bound to adhere to it. And they look into the history and conclude that it, that it has a broader, more open textured meaning. Might well be wrong, there are arguments in the dissent that it's wrong, but as a matter of method, they're actually all converging on the, the relevance of the, of the text and the original meaning. Same thing in Brown versus Board of Education, where before sort of launching into all the stuff about sociology and separate being inherently unequal that we all know, the court feels the need to fight the original meaning, at least to a draw. They have re-argument on the question of the original meaning. The justices internally get a long set of research about the original meaning that Alexander Pickle later publishes, and the court opens its opinion with that by saying, you know, here we think the original meaning is <coughs> permits the kind of interpretation we're going to do, and only then do they proceed. So I think if you look at, at across sort of all of the canonical cases or all the cases that are still canonical today, you discover that there are no cases that openly flout the original meaning, and when the court does talk about sort of methods competing, originalism wins. So the sort of surprising conclusion out of looking at how all the cases come together is that some form of originalism, the sort of the moderate form I just described, is actually our law. <clears throat> then the question is, does that matter? What kind of implications does that have? I think it has one very important implication that I talk about, which is it, it, about how judges ought to behave in terms of constitutional law. So there's lots of philosophical debate about do people generally have an obligation to obey the law? Does it, you know, can you change the law? Does the law have some kind of moral force? But for judges, a lot of those philosophical debates are beside the point because judges promise to obey the law they promise to obey the Constitution. And that's a, a sort of 
a condition we intentionally impose on them before giving them the power to lock people up, adjudicate property rights, the promise that they'll do so only according to the law. So if I'm right that our constitutional law contains a sort of hard bottom line of a certain form of originalism, that means judges actually are all required to be this kind of originalist. It means that academic theories that are openly anti-originalist, let's say Bruce Ackerman on constitutional moments, uh, cannot be lawfully adopted by judges. Maybe they could be imposed in some other way, but it's inconsistent with what a judge actually promises to do when they take office. And that's also probably true, by the way, of some of the sort of stricter forms of originalism that aren't consistent with what I described. There are originalists who say precedent is inconsistent with originalism. That form of sort of hardcore originalism, again, is probably inconsistent with our current rules for what is the law and what are, what are judges supposed to do. Uh, <clears throat> One last thing I'll mention. Um, you might, I mean, there are a lot of cases, there are a lot of possible counterexamples. So many people might look at some piece of our practice and conclude that what I've said might be mostly true, but there's some important exception or some set of cases where even the originalism I've defined doesn't appear to be the law. I think even if that's true, actually a lot of the same implications still carry over. So even if originalism is only mostly our law, uh, it's still true that it's an important piece of the practice that judges are obligated to, to adhere to. I think it's probably still true, actually, that judges can, can treat it as the most important modality, even if there are some sort of exceptions to it. And it's still true that, that originalism is this sort of legally priv privileged method. Uh, it's still true that a judge can't sort of read all of Bruce Ackerman's books and conclude these sound like a great idea and just start imposing them, because they don't have the same kind of of legal foothold or legal purchase as the text of the Constitution and its original, original context do. Um, one last thing I'll say is that the, I'm sort of aware in, in giving this, this pitch for originalism, there's a risk, sort of one counter argument is this seems obviously false. Uh, here are some set of cases that are inconsistent with the original meaning. And the other sort of obvious counter argument is this seems so true that it's trivial that originalism as I've defined it has sort of no content and therefore it doesn't matter that it's part of the law. So I guess the claim I'll make is I, I'm aware of that, but that the, the claim here is that there are actual practice to find something in between those two poles. Uh, there is a form of originalism that is uh, neither so strict as to be obviously inconsistent with our practice, nor so kind of loose as to be entirely trivial. Thank you. <laughs>